Symptoms of anxiety and depression in teens have doubled during the pandemic, according to a report. What is the reason for this crisis and how can you as a parent make a difference? Well, we cover that and more on this episode of The Unapologetic Show. Hello, parents. Welcome to The Unapologetic Show, where we defend truth without compromise with Dr. Bobby Conway, the one-minute apologist. I'm your host, Tim Hall. Today, we have two extra guests with us. We have Heather Conway, and we have Woo! Dawson Conway. Woo-hoo! So we got the whole Conway plan to talk about this really important issue. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and so this month, we on this sh- on the show are just going to be addressing some subject around mental health, and even though we aren't necessarily mental health professionals, uh, we have been affected by the mental health issues and we buy this crisis in general. And so we want to share kind of our experience and our insight uh, with our audience and how that subject matter of mental health kind of intersects with Christianity and that we can equip the church to deal with this topic. One of the stats that I just thought was um, really alarming was that adolescent girls have seen a 51% increase in ER visits for suicide. Mm. And that just kind of gives us a little bit of a picture of kind of this mental health crisis. Bobby, can you talk a little bit more about what is, how do we categorize, how do we talk about what is the mental health crisis that we're seeing right now? Yeah, glad you, Tim. And it's great to have my tribe (laughs) on with us today. I know that our daughter, Haley, uh, she really should be here because she's just mentally jacked up too. So, she's the uh, worst the, of us yes, that's right. The whole <laughs> right, Conway right. tribe has got issues, but uh, she's not with us today, and that's okay. But we're excited to be able to talk about this because the mental health crisis is literally a worldwide pandemic. Mm. And I think that the underlying issues of mental health, Tim, have always been there, but what we're seeing is stuff coming to light. And I think with the emergence of neuroscience and some of the different developmental stuff that we've seen in the fields of psychology and some of these different uh, endeavors that have been researched out in, 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 um, with psychiatrists and psychotherapy, it's all adding to kind of the story of mental health. Yeah. And as a result, we're kind of like a a culture that's addicted to find your label. Mm. So there is this sense where in the culture that we live today, uh, there's a lot of labels that have been put out there. And in a world where everybody wants to know who they are, whether it is the Enneagram, they want to know what issues they struggle (laughs) with as well. And listen, we have went through a lot. Our culture is going through a revolution in a big time way, uh, political, moral, uh, all kinds of sexual revolution, and all of these type of issues that we're up against uh, are causing a lot of unrest and mm. angst for people. And I think that all of this can, are contributing factors to what we're up against. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the, the reasons for this crisis. Uh, Heather, what, what would you kind of pinpoint are some of the, uh, the reasons that we're having this crisis right now? Yeah, well, I would start by saying there's no cookie cutter answer to this. There's no one size fits all. It's very layered. Mm -hmm. But I would start by saying, you know, actions have consequences. And here we are two years into a global pandemic and everything that has happened since then, right? We have kids that have been locked down. They're isolated. And 70% of parents said that their kids have been negatively impacted their mental health has been negatively mm-hmm. impacted from this pandemic. Yeah. And when I thought about that 70%, I'm like, I really think it's probably more like 100% because <laughs> I don't know anyone's <laughs> right. um, mental health that wasn't effective. But all that to say, the, these actions have consequences. Locking our kids down and putting them in isolation. Mm-hmm. We're meant for community. We're not meant to be alone. We're meant to be with each other. And we can't lock them down. And then on top of that, you throw them into homeschooling, right? Yeah. <laughs> Falling behind mm-hmm. in school. I know for homeschooling for some people, it went well. For <laughs> Dawson and I, not so much. I homeschooled him yeah. when he was in seventh grade. And I think it lasted literally for about, <laughs> about a month. Three it was, months. It was like a, a, a three-month vacation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, let's go to Target. Right. That's your home ec. You know, let's yeah, that's let's right. go to the park. Yeah. That's your PE. Yeah. So 
but to bring it all back to seriousness, like homeschooling is a big struggle. And then I think about the single parents out there, you know, here they are, they're trying to hold down a full-time job. They're trying to put food on the table. They're coming home. They're trying to help their kids with homework and they don't have it. They're not teachers. And then their kids are left with a lot of anxiety because they're falling behind. Mm. And I think we need to talk about mask, right? I mean, I know that's a polarizing subject, but when you cover up half of a kid's face, they're missing a lot. They're missing social cues. They're missing, mm-hmm. missing emotional connection. And I think that has had a huge impact because these kids are now going to grow up into high school and college and be adults and expect to carry on eye contact and have those social cues. And they don't know how because they've been hiding behind a mask for years now. And it's just they're normal. Yeah. So there's so many other things. The routines and rhythms have been thrown off yep, and yep. structure and all the things. And we haven't even touched on social media, um, <laughs> which I know we will be here shortly. But that's just a few of the things. And like I said, actions have consequences. Yeah. Well, Dawson, why don't you why don't you cover that a little bit? How has technology and particularly social media um, mm-hmm. played a role in this crisis, particularly with teens and youth? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's several different ways to approach this question. I think the one that we always hear it's it's true, but it's it's kind of a, a it's stereotypical. It's that social media can make people question their identity. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you know, you can you can paint this false image of yourself on social media, and when people see that, it can make them feel insecure. I kind of want to take a a dip, offer a different insight. Maybe I look at social media as as a stimulant in a sense. Like when you're on social media, it stimulates your brain. If you don't believe me, just go on Instagram reels and and see how much, <laughs> look at the clock and see how much time passed. Yeah, right. You're going to wake up Guilty. like yeah. the, the lotus flower in Percy Jackson or something and you're going to be like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. Like an hour, an hour has passed by. Totally. Um, but it doesn't, social media, a lot of kids have a tough time sitting with their thoughts. You have interpersonal um, communication and then you have intrapersonal communication. Um, Th- thoughts and dialogue between you and your, your your consciousness, so to speak. And what happens is there's this area in your brain called the, it's called the ventral tagmental area, right? Mm-hmm. And so the ventral tagmental area of your brain is responsible for the reward system in your body. Mm-hmm. So if you're on Instagram and you're getting like likes and you're getting positive feedback, what it does is it essentially... Um, fires up dopamine receptors mm-hmm. in your body and you're getting these little like um, moments of, of joy, right? <laughs> and, and, and then once you're off social media, that's gone. So what ends up happening is, is your reality becomes the media world um, mm. because that's where you're experiencing the most mm, amount of dopamine yeah. releases. And if mm-hmm. you're not getting dopamine releases in school in your every day-to-day life, then you're going to want to go right back to that phone. And mm. so it sucks you in without your conscious awareness yeah. and there's a danger, very, very dangerous side to that. So, mm. uh, yeah. Yeah. so true. I, I, I read on one report that said social media can kind of amplify what's going on. So if people are you know happy and kind of jovial and their mental health is really good and they get on social media, then that kind of starts to amplify some of those types of things. And they're like, yeah. But if they're on the downswing, it mm-hmm. starts to amplify, amplify mm-hmm. the downswing. And that's yeah. where we see particularly with um, the, the girls that I was talking about, so oftentimes they're comparing to one another. Yes. So they're seeing kind of a, a highlight reel of their friends' yeah. lives. There's a big component of uh, the fear of missing out, you know, and I think everybody can say that they've experienced that when you look on social media and you see all of your friends went to this thing that you didn't either get invited to or you didn't get to go to for whatever reason. Oh my gosh. And that can be very difficult yeah. um, for, for people's mental health. But it, also, kinda, it also, I was going to just say, yeah. that, Tim, I think you're bringing up some good points here. It is a breeding ground for developing an in- inauthentic character. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unless you've got like some amazing grit to show up authentic on social media, which most of us are a little bit into people pleasing more than we'd like to admit. Like I don't wake up in the morning and think, boy, I sure would like to develop some new enemies today. (laughs) And so it's hard to show up and be your authentic self because we're such a cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And so that that works Mm -hmm. against the authenticity that we're looking for. And that becomes problematic too. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For our well, mental health. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Bobby, round out, particularly when we're talking to, to parents and they're thinking about their kids, round out kind of just some of the depth of this issue. What are going to be like the lasting effects if we don't get a handle on what's going on uh, in, in our world with this, this mental health crisis for our kids? So uh, one of the th- things that we're going to have to consider is how did we get to this place? So number one, we need to realize that Mental health is not a new issue. Mm. It's been around. It's just 
more recognized, um, and it's it, it's literally intensified. Mm-hmm. It's really intensified. And so, what's caused this? So, for example, we make fast-paced decisions in our culture, uh, where we're experiencing this moral revolution. What we what we're not weighing out is how is this going to affect the mental health of future generations. Right. So we're experiencing the mental health of this present generation for decisions that we've made. So take for example, we we don't have a lot of resilience mm-hmm. um, as as a, as a generation. You think about like the greatest generation, the World War II people, and the resilience that they had. Those that were a part maybe of the Great Depression, and you think about the resilient that some resiliency that some of our ancestors had. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. our generation, the Gen Xers, safety became like the number one thing. We got to keep our kids safe, and you know what? When you get in the shower, put this helmet on and make sure you wear your mm-hmm. get, get your Purell all <laughs> over you. Yeah. Don't walk down the street. <laughs> and so it was like we put our kids in a cocoon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some of that was is we were parenting as Gen Xers in the midst of the emergence of the internet. Yeah. And the world became smaller and it looked more dangerous. Yeah. And so we fastened our kids up in multiple seatbelts. Right. And uh, mm-hmm. it was like, you can't watch <laughs> this. You, you, you got to make sure that you, you know, you, you wear a helmet when you do this. Like kids don't ride bikes. You would think like you're immoral if you let your kids go for a joy <laughs> bike ride without a helmet on. Yeah. yeah. Like, How and I think, they survive? like I had a, <laughs> I had a concrete half pipe that was in my neighborhood that I used to BMX in and jump all over the place right. as a kid right. with no helmet. Yeah. Okay, right. so I'm not saying that was good. They eventually filled the pit because a lot of people got injured. Right. But all this to say, now I think it was Boston College that that the kids were worried about the guest speaker that was mm. coming and they were worried that that it was going to trigger them. And they needed a safe, safe space if they felt triggered. And so there was a separate room where they had coloring books yeah. and cartoons and the gummy bears and candies if they felt triggered. Well, here's the deal. And then it, the safety worked out on one level for physical safety. I mean, you got your car seats and all that. But now it's got to a point like you can't even speak out what you believe, mm-hmm, right. and so this is where you come to Jonathan Haidt and his co-author, The Coddling of the American Mind. Yeah, it's great book. And so there is an element where we've lost resilience, Tim, yeah. and I think that we need to be empathetic, we need to be compassionate, but we also need to get back to some of that old grit that the culture once had, and we need to realize if, listen, we have safety measures on everything, and I don't know how well that's serving mm-hmm. us as well. Yeah. Well, I, and I do think you mentioned safety measures, and those are fantastic, but sometimes they often can go too far. Dawson, talk to us a little bit about, you know, particularly like TV shows. Like there mm-hmm. was a show uh, that came out within the last year or so called 13 Reasons Why. Maybe yep. sketch out a little bit of the plot without. No spoiler alerts. We, uh, <laughs> sketch out a little bit of the plot and just talk about you know how that is a, a picture of kind of what's going on, yeah. a reflection almost of what's going on in our kids' lives. Mm-hmm. Well, first right off the bat, just to tag on with, with what my dad was saying, it'll tie into this. Mental health is not an excuse. It, it's actually just an instrument um, that you, it's like a, it's a it's a guide to being able to better yourself so that you can function well as an individual and also in society. Um, oftentimes we look at mental health as an excuse. I'm depressed. I can't do this. I can't do that. Coddling of the American mind. These emotions, once you can work through them, they actually help you um, function effectively. So you have shows like. 13 Reasons Why, as you mentioned, let's take that for an example. Um, The plot is basically you have a young female. She uh, definitely was bullied, definitely was going through some tough times in high school. Um, That is just undeniably true. Um, And then uh, she is struggling with some suicidal thoughts ultimately. And those suicidal thoughts grow and grow and grow. And what I picked up from the show is there is this deep uh, lack of validation she had. Mm -hmm. Um, And she really, really needed that validation, it seemed like, to, to feel like, her life was was meaningful, mm-hmm. um, and you know ultimately she ended up taking her life and then writing these letters to all these different people that she felt contributed to her lack of validation. Now, mm-hmm. right off the bat, and I can relate to this: if your life um, is dependent on other people's validation, that means that you don't you're not finding your identity in something. Uh, concrete. Yeah, concrete exactly. Reason. You yeah. need to find your identity in something strong, stronger than that, and you have to you have to think 
um, of your self worth more than than receiving validation from other mm. people. Because that's if good. that's what your your identity is rooted in, then then it's not going to take much for you to question your very life, and that's a sure. very very scary place mm-hmm. to be. Um, what I don't like about shows like that is it glorified it in a sense. Because if you take your life, people who are bullied, my heart goes out to you. I mean that from the bottom part of mm-hmm. from the. I, I've been there before. I'm empathizing with you. Mm-hmm. I, I am sorry for people who have gone through that. Um, and as someone who has struggled with intrusive thoughts myself. Um, I, I know what that feels like, but it, ultimately, if you take your life, that is on you. Um, and in this show, she almost got her uh, revenge, so to speak, because there was these letters, and 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 I think that glorifying that is is not going to be beneficial to people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. well, I appreciate the kind of oversight there, the kind of the overview of the TV show and kind of how that's weighing in. Mm-hmm. Um, Heather, talk to us. Maybe you and Bobby can spe- specifically talk to us about uh, red flags that parents need to be aware of. We've been talking about just kind of this whole idea of the crisis and kind of what's going on in social media and TV shows and how they all play into that. What are some red flags that um, if parents notice, they might need to take a kind of a more serious step than just having a conversation or kind of just the standard parenting model, but they might need to go to a family counselor or they might need to seek a pastor's help or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, I want to encourage parents to not check out. Like, this is so important. I think this is crucial, number one. You have to stay plugged into what is going on with your kids. You know, keeping those lines of communication open Mm -hmm. is first and foremost what you have to do because you want to be available to Mm -hmm. your kids. But some red flags. So, you know, I would say lack of motivation or a lack of interest in things that they once really liked and really you know, took part in. That's one thing. Um, sleep. If you notice that they're, um, not sleeping or sleeping too much, I think that's a huge red flag because if you're not sleeping, if you're chronically sleep deprived, your mental health is going to be impacted. So I would definitely be looking for that, um, loss of appetite, not eating, eating too much, um, withdrawing from the family, withdrawing from friends. All of these things are your, things you need to be looking out for in red flags. But mm-hmm. my encouragement to parents is to stay plugged in, mm-hmm. you know, be available to them, be present and, and be open to whenever they want to talk. Cause guess what? Mm-hmm. Kids don't usually want to talk when you want to talk. <laughs> they mm-hmm. want to right. talk when they want to talk. And that may be at midnight at night <laughs> when you're trying to put them to bed and you are exhausted and can't even hold your eyes open. Right. But we have to stay present and stay available so that our kids don't yeah. uh, fall off the radar. Yeah, I wanted to just that that brought up a good idea here. Like, there's this on the on the topic of validation. Parents often uh, have a tough time being able to understand their kids and validate them. Maybe mm-hmm. it's because their kids' emotions are very complex. I definitely fall into that category. Um, but there's something <laughs> there's something yes. called a, it's called a mutual <laughs> mind state, right? So you have what's called mirror neurons in your brain, and what happens is is when someone when you're on the same wave, so to speak, as someone, and you're having good like conversation, um, the you your mirror neurons are reflecting one another. And what that does is it allows you to really feel um, empathy. It allows you to feel validation. So parents um, oftentimes, and, and we all fall into this, this trap, we all, we are, we're all problem fixers, right? And it's rooted in good intentions, I believe that. But, but making sure that you're really listening to your kid um, and, and validating him and trying to put yourself in their shoes, um, that will go a long way and it'll let their emotional walls come down so that in that moment, then you can offer the advice. Yeah. Excellent. You know, I think as well, these are great points that you guys are bringing out. And just to go on record, I mean, we genuinely have experienced a tremendous amount of mental health crisis in our family. Mm. Um, And uh, we can all relate to it uh, in some significant ways. Uh, Dawson and myself in particular can relate to uh, a lot of escape thinking, suicidal ideation when we've been in some hard spots. I think a couple things that I would say that lessons that I've learned as a dad, number one, don't always treat things as a moral issue Mm -hmm. with your kids because when they're lashing out and acting out, it looks like maybe they're being immoral, but when it is a mental health, it's not like, see, the culture makes everything a mental health issue. The church makes everything a moral Mm -hmm. issue. And sometimes it's not that. And when I realize that he's not trying to come off rebellious in his, maybe his, the way he was speaking at me, 
it helped me to be there for him better. And still, when I mess up as his dad, it's when I'm looking at it on through that lens. Now, right. does he ever morally mess up? Well, of course, so right. do I. Yeah. <laughs> but but there are times where I feel like I, I've missed it there. And I think that just realizing, like maybe I, I, a woman going through PMS and it's hormonal, mm. yeah, like that, yes, yeah, she has to take responsibility for that. But the, but the husband really needs to be there for her. Right. And and I think the same way as parents. The, the next thing I'd say is this: when your kids bring up things like their suicidal ideation. We have to see that in some ways as a gift, as uncomfortable as it makes us feel. Mm. Because many parents have lost their kids to suicide and they had no idea it was coming. And I can say I, I've never liked the conversation uh, that if I knew where Dawson was at, for yeah. example. It, yeah. It's very difficult. At times, I've made it about myself because it's a lot to cope with. But I've also been able to say, dude, you got to keep coming. If you ever feel anything, we've got to talk through this. Yeah. So I think that we're a family that's learning this mental health journey together and how to better be there for each other. And we want to minister out of our pain. Yeah. yeah I, sure. I think a great way to, to close this episode would be for us to kind of just share a little bit of thoughts, uh, maybe some advice that we could give to uh, pastors and church leaders as they try to play a role in solving this mental health crisis. So maybe maybe we'll start with Dawson and we can kind of work back and end with Bobby. How pastors can play a better role with mental health yeah. crisis. Yeah. Well, my dad made a good point. Churches make everything about it's a moral issue. And right. then like the world, is it's a mental health issue. Um, I think that Christianity and, and psychology, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, people oftentimes miss that. Um, telling, telling, telling your, your, telling people that um, you just need to trust God more. Telling people that you just your faith isn't strong enough. You need to pray more, and then your mental health will be restored. Triggered. You know, <laughs> yeah. Those those cliche sayings. Um, while they may be true to some degree, people don't want to hear that. Yeah. People want to be heard. They want to be validated. So, yes. you know, I appreciate my dad's vulnerability as a pastor because that lets people not feel alienated because he lets them know here he is as a leader. He lets them know, hey, I'm one of you. We all go through it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I would say first and foremost, just being humble um, and just being honest about the whole situation. Yeah, yeah. for mm -hmm. sure. Concur with that. I, I hate it when people say, have you prayed about it? Mm. Have you read the scripture? It's like, oh, duh, I didn't think about that. Should have prayed. Yeah. It's like, no, that, that's where you, f God is going to meet us there, but that's not where you start. But I do also think in churches, we have to be mindful to just make it a part of our DNA to mm. talk about it. And I know that's what we're doing at Image Church. Like that is one of our core values that we are just putting that out there. Like we care about mental health. We talk about mental health awareness month in May. That's another thing you can do. But I think it's so important that you just make it part of your DNA to just normalize that it's okay to not be okay, that you're going to have bad days, that you're going to have anxiety, that you're going to have depression, that you're even going to have suicidal thoughts. You know, we kind of throw anxiety and depression out there like, oh, that's just, everyone's okay with that. But there's mm -hmm. deeper stuff. There's people that are struggling with wanting to take their lives. And I think just making it a part of your DNA and talking about it from the pulpit in small groups and women's groups and youth ministry, I think that lowers the defense. That's yeah. one thing we can do. Yeah, we really do have to give people permission to talk about this. I mean, that's, that's, that's a desperate spot. Like I'm in a place where I'm having suicidal ideation. That is so hard to say out loud, mm -hmm. but just think about what I'm saying here. If, if our kids get the message that we can't handle that, they can't yeah. come and talk to us about it. We've made it about us. Mm -hmm. We haven't shown our concern for them. And the reality is as much as we might not like them to have those thoughts, or we want to live in la-la land thinking they won't have those thoughts. If those thoughts come, we need to deal with it. And I'd say, it's like with doubt in the church. Yeah. I mean, I was suffering and plagued by doubts for years, and by God's grace, he brought me through it. I'd write doubting toward faith, and it's just amazing what God did there. But yeah, people come along and say, you just need to read your Bible more. I say, you know what, that's the problem. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm collecting more doubts yeah. because I don't understand some of the things in Especially there. Especially when you have OCD. Right? Right, right, now, right. Now, now, I get it. Like, God brought me through that. But people, they're very cliche and yeah. black and white. And some of the most, and, and here's the thing. If you don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not real. Yeah. Just because yeah. you might not be able to relate doesn't mean others aren't experiencing this. Mm -hmm. And I think that just creates a myopic, black and white, narrow-minded, self-righteous, condemning, shaming kind of a personality. Yeah. And we got to get rid of that so that the church 
isn't a shaming center, but rather mm-hmm. it becomes a healing center. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Well, we we right here at the end, we talked about some myths that uh, often come up, and we're going to deal with those in a future episode. One thing that I would say that the church can do is if you are checking out this episode and you thought it was helpful, please forward it on to somebody else, uh, whether that's a parent or other church leaders or other church members, and we would love for them to check out this episode. And we hope that you return for another episode of The Unapologetic Show next week.